uh, in New Zealand, but still very excited, and especially about the topic today, uh, neuroscience and uh, this so brain wires, neuroscience, it's something I really love to look into and study um, in my free time. So I'm really excited. So uh, yeah, looking forward. Hi, it's Ling here from Bangkok. Yeah, it's early, but not as early as, as a day here, there. <laughs> it's 7 a.m. here in Bangkok. And yeah, welcome everyone um, to our International Coaching Week. And I'm also excited about the topic as well. I mean, the whole week long, all the topic are so exciting. Yeah. And yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> we have the new shirt too. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, um, Dinesh here from New Zealand. I've only just joined the faculty, so I'm very <laughs> curious to see how it all works. But this particular topic I've been looking forward to all week, so uh, very much in line with, well, I suppose we'll supplement uh, what I've learned through my coaching journey, uh, or as a new coach. Hi, Thank you so much. Um, everyone for sharing. Thank you, faculty. And we're very pleased and honored that you would join us today, especially at 4 a.m. Um, that, that's just my thing. <laughs> I'm especially impressed with that. So again, welcome, everybody. We're really glad and excited to have you. Um, so our topic tonight, as you kind of, I think everybody already knows, is sort of a blended uh, topic on communication and brain wiring between men and women. You know, coaching is a process that involves communication. And so the cognitive differences between women and men can really influence communication. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, and we know that in a world that's now dominated by digital and AI solutions, human to human contact with all the variations of verbal and nonverbal language and expressions, you know, this matters more than ever um, to keep us connected. And so communication is so important. And so Although the findings of studies on the effects of the, the differences are not necessarily conclusive, there's been a lot of new research that is going to be talked about today because there's constantly new research regarding the brain, as we know. I'm a big neuroscience uh, studier myself, Anne Crane, so I can relate to that. Um, so we can now see some of the evidence of some of the inherent differences between men and women's brains. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And very excited to introduce our primary speakers for today. Uh, our two primary main speakers, we have Hannah Ferguson. Hannah, raise your hand. There we go, Hannah Ferguson, who is a CMA professional coach from cohort 374. She's also a trainer and facilitator in marketing and business communications for over 18 years. So she knows what she's doing with communications. And then we also have Adam Nashberg or Naj for short, which we always love saying his last name, is uh, also a CMA professional coach from cohort 374. And he's also a lifelong communicator with 21 years as a reporter and editor with the Wall Street Journal. And for the past eight years, head of a, a PR of a, several different companies. So the, again, quite an expert in communication. So I think we're in pretty good hands tonight with these two. And I'm just gonna ask you two both to take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Although I do have to warn you that I am digitally cursed Last year, right around this time, my, my high school asked me to deliver a presentation to an auditorium filled with 400 people. They're in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I'm where, where I'm from, and I'm sitting in Singapore where I am now, and I begin my speech, and the room goes quiet, and it was only after I finished my presentation that I noticed the frantic SMSs saying, your feed cut off, so um, just bear with me today and someone please let me know somehow in writing somehow uh, if, if we get cut off. Um, so anyway, let me introduce myself just very quickly. Um, Wendy said pretty much everything about me. So we'll, we'll slide right into um, what I am rather than who I am. As, as Wendy mentioned, I'm Adam Nadgeberg. I'm a storyteller. I'm a lifelong communicator. I spent 25 years talking to people listening to them, hearing their stories and sharing them with others as a newspaper, radio and video reporter. And for the last eight years, I've made my living in public relations. So you can call me a professional communication specialist or as some of my former colleagues in media call me a spin doctor. But I'm in no way special because all of us, 
all humans are communicators in one way or another. That's how Homo sapiens have rolled for at least the last 300,000 years. It's how we interact with each other, how we come to understand each other, how we avoid wars and cause them. Communications is how we convey practical information like there's a fire, get out, or I'm hungry. And it's how we convey emotions like I'm sad or I'm really angry. Even before we had the rich panoply of languages we hear around the globe today, we use sounds and gestures to communicate that information and our emotions. Symbols, crude paintings, drawings, pictograms, ideograms, they used to convey information about happenings, events, thoughts, and emotions as a shared experience. And portability of those shared experiences came through verbal storytelling, which actually became a profession long before the creation of movable type allowed newspapers to become a form of mass media. And when writing came about, we were able to both memorialize and spread our communications even further and more efficiently. Then came movable type and manuscripts and books. And I'm speeding through history here, but roll with me, please. In the 19th century, we saw the emergence of telegraph and telephone and into the 20th century, radio and TV, Communications were being driven by technology, diminishing the friction of spreading messages from one point to many. With the rise of technology and the gathering of large audiences reading newspapers, listening to radio, watching TV, that gave rise to both the influence of marketing and advertising on communications and also to public relations. The idea was to get the brains of readers, listeners, and viewers to light up and think about buying things eating things, drinking things, using a certain kind of soap or toothpaste. And PR was aimed at getting you to think a certain way about a company, its values, and its products. Now, this new type of messaging shaped interpersonal, human-to-human -human interactions. New expressions entered language, new expected behavior emerged from TV and the movies into our real world. Sociology, psychology, and neuroscience were all put to use in ways that affected human, affected human communications in, again, our real world, now a very modern world. As much as we spent hundreds of years trying to shape communications, bending them the way we deliver messages and talking about things using technology and science, there was never a real threat to removing humans from the communications equation. But as society gets more digital and technology speeds ahead, we now see computers, especially using generative artificial intelligence, threatening to do just that. So what? Why should we care? If technology means software or an app can replace a human, make a process more efficient, what's wrong with that? An algorithm can already drive your car for you, can turn your lights on and off when you're not even home. But how would you feel receiving a cancer diagnosis from a doctor bot? You could surely teach it about bedside manner, but will it pick up on your unique response to the diagnosis and shape its own behavior accordingly? In such communications, a computer does not, it cannot feel. It has no emotions. It can't read your eyes or your body language. Everything it knows and learns is part of its programming, its algorithm. I wanna have you consider one thing. Are you, all of you, us, actually more like our computers, more like chat GPT than we realize? Whether we realize it or not, much of human communications is already based on ritual, tendencies, and traits that are so deeply ingrained in us that we don't even notice them. They're our algorithm. I want you to think about something nonverbal like a handshake. How much import we place in a momentary squeeze of the right hand of another, how much we judge about a person from a gesture. You walk into a room, someone introduces themselves to you, comes forward and extends a hand. Because it's expected social behavior, almost without thought, you extend your own hand and clasp the palm and fingers of the other person. And right there, you think to yourself, wow, that's a clammy hand. She must be really nervous. Or what a dead fish. He must be a weak person. Or even something 
It's like someone's trying to prove he's an alpha male, squeezing my damned hand so hard. What smiles, handshakes, facial expressions, and other unconscious social behaviors show is that the ritualistic behavior is ingrained in us and that we've almost turned something secular into something that's sacred, or perhaps it's the other way around. These days, whatever influence our language or tribe has had on us, communications are also cloaked in a layer of artifice guided by what we see on TV, in movie theaters, and from advertising and public relations, which look to create impressions rather than letting you discover them for yourself. What we're left with as coaches of people, trying to help them help themselves with their performance or help them mitigate issues in their lives, is peeling back layers of the onion to find what's at the core. Not what you want me to see, but what's really there inside you. It requires time. It requires the building of trust the lowering of self-defense mechanisms and a stripping away of the societal rituals, norms, and influence or pollution caused by advertisers and flacks like me. To show you how ingrained some behavior is in us, whether conscious or unconscious, my cohort colleague, Hannah and I have devised an exercise. Its goal is to show you how we are to a large extent also like computers with what we store in our brains. Through this exercise, you'll see how much of what we consider unique human behavior is actually pre-programmed into us, either hardwired by our DNA from hundreds of thousands of years of learning to defend and express ourselves, or also in large part from social norms that have formed and we've unconsciously adopted to get along with each other, to hide from each other, to feel more comfortable with each other, and how much effect the neuroscience of PR and advertising has trained into our behavior. Our exercise is largely improv-based. We're offering up the setting, but we ask you guys, yes, we're going to ask you to participate. We're going to ask you to give us a specific topic and tone to discuss in the setting. Like if we say, firefighter talking to a homeowner after a blaze, you might say, for the topic, they're talking about the cause of the fire. And someone else can add, make it silly or make it angry. That's because we want you to see how humans can spontaneously try to understand, fit into and fall into certain behavior regardless of an unfamiliar setting. It, it's not scientific, but it should illustrate how much of our lives today are based on live role playing and how critical it is for a coach to communicate in such a way that you're able to eventually get to the person's core and bring out who they really are and what's really bothering them. Thank you. So shall we throw up those uh, that first slide and jump into uh, the improv scenario? Actually, before we do that, what I think I might do is just share a little bit about women's and men's brain wiring. We're actually introducing the brain wiring differences because between men and women, um, we need to know as coaches specifically, but also in all the relationships that we have, that if we have an awareness of how the brain is wired, um, we're looking specifically at male, female today, we can also reflect on what may, may be affecting our communication patterns, especially when we're coaching. Men are said to be different in personalities, abilities and temperament from women. And for example, men are said to be, I'm, I'm going to ask this, aim this question at you, Naj. For example, men are said to be rational, good in spatial abilities, the maths, thinking in terms of the whole, while women are said to be emotional, intuitive, good in language abilities and detail oriented. We're going to explore a little bit, little bit about through these exercises. Many think that these differences are just learned responses, but science is proving that there are very real differences in the way that males and females think, feel, and react. So if we can pop up that uh, slide about the brain wiring differences and have a we look at these, it's a really cool way of um, seeing broad differences. Remember folks, this is not to stereotype, or to put us in a box, but to, from a scientific perspective, brains have been studied and continue to be studied. And we do see differences between men's and women's wiring of the brain. For a male, it does tend to be uh, objective. 
very much interested in practicalities. Um, whereas a woman often will have a more sympathetic and concern for individuals, uh, very interested in building relationships as opposed to task driven. Males often are detached from emotions, whereas women generally are affective in nature, wanting to be in tune with not only their own emotions, but others emotions as well. Males, br male brains can often be compartmentalized. My husband often talks about he has uh, one box and it's often empty in his brain. Uh, women tend to have a number of boxes and have those integrated so that the synapses in the brain are moving around in a way that can make connections very, very well. Uh, men's brains can be, and we'll show you some of the science behind this, lead generally to being very active, promoting active behaviors and even aggressive behaviors. Uh, women tend to be uh, more contemplative and will consider before being um, quite proactive at, at times when they need to be. Male, male brains tend to have a greater aptitude for abstraction and conceptualization. Um, and women's brains focus on on the concrete and on details. I think that's been swapped around in the slide. I think it's the other, I think it may be the other way around. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, men's brains excel in vis visuospatial and mathematical abilities, and women generally have a greater verbal ability. We're going to again explore this in a bit of detail with some of the science uh, and the research that we've um, that's been undertaken most recently. Um, but there, my husband says to, to our friends and family, don't argue with her. She'll talk the back legs off a donkey. The verbal ability of a woman is often the thing that will just keep women together, nat, 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 nata, nata, all the way through for hours on end. So, Naj, let's uh, have a look at these improv scenarios, eh? Let's bring right. up that. Let's bring up those. Uh, so the first one is the, the doctor and patient, is that right? Or oh, actually, we do have that field oh. of tulips. We do have the field of tulips, but we can come back to the doctor and patient. All right. Yeah. This is all improv, so we're just rolling with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> Absolutely. This is just to give you an idea, folks, in terms of if you, when we ask you to give us the scenario, we're going to give you this scenario first with the field of tulips. Um Basically, this is Naj and I who are on a journey. We are holidaying in Europe and seeing, we stop and just see this amazing field, just beautiful tulips, male brain, female brain. What are we seeing, Naj? Uh, tough to mow the lawn. Oh, can you not just appreciate the beauty of this? Look at that field, look at the colors. Look at the look at what nature is giving us. You have to use a lot of water to keep nature giving us that stuff, huh? Mm, fertilizer. Look, it's worth it, Naj. Just think about the times that we'll be able to sit and hold hands and just gaze at this view. As long as it doesn't get in the way of my kickoff. Sport? What are you talking about? We're talking, Naj, concentrate. Look at this view in front of you. We're here in Europe. Appreciate what we're experiencing. I appreciate it, but I'm kind of hungry and kickoffs in about 15 minutes. Quickest way to a man is through his stomach. What do the colors remind you of, Naj? They remind me of how beautiful you are. Thank you, honey. They also remind me of McDonald's wrappers. Should we head to McDonald's? That's why I love you so much, honey. Oh, let's go. All righty. So by all means, folks, as we come up with the these couple of two or three scenarios here, jump on in. You give us the opportunity to um, explore this and we will throw it open for you. In fact, Actually, for the field of tulips that you just saw there, what was it that you um, as viewers and listeners were experiencing in the communication between Naj and I? What was it that you were experiencing? Either throw it into the chat box or even just shout it out and let's let's see how we go. What were you witnessing, observing?
Anyone, Matt? Well, this is quieter than our cohort classes. <laughs> <laughs> mm, seeing two very different perspectives. Was there anything, Judith, in that that you noticed specifically? If you were specific about looking at those perspectives, what would you expand on that statement, seeing two different perspectives? Um, Anyone else can jump in as well. I, when I looked at it as a female, I saw beauty, peace, calm, and almost said, let's just stop in this world at the moment and enjoy it. And then from Naja's perspective, I felt that I was seeing the practicalities of how it came to be, and then some other distractions that were taking him away from just enjoying this beautiful visual. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? That's great. Thank you, Judith. Appreciate your, your contribution on that one. We've got Alina saying very relatable. The man was very logical. Yeah. And it, just those different perceptions. Jump on in, jump on in. Um, it, it's interesting. I When I look at it, I go, yes, that's gorgeous, but gosh, they're straight lines. And somebody's taken a lot of precision to do that. And I also go, that's quite complicated to mow the lawn. So, so it's kind of like you, you see it, but you see it from different perspectives. And I think, you know, yeah, there's the, the male and female, but there's also the ability to see it as one person from different perspectives. Yeah. Exactly, eh? exactly. And that's, we're, we're obviously exaggerating and we'll do so, certainly through the improv, um, but the ability to see things from through different lenses when we choose to or how we're wired does make a huge difference. Great. Thank you, Jan. Awesome. All righty. So let's jump into, let's jump in, into this. Um, yeah, we've, uh, let's do these scenarios. Do you want to throw up the first one? Let's yeah, uh, we go back to the slide on the, the doctor and patient. It's funny, you get used to nonlinear editing of video yeah. and you go back to PowerPoint and, and you end up, yeah, with, with this. So, so um, yeah, who's, um, I guess this is the setting doctor speaking to patient. So throw it out to the audience. Uh, what are we talking about? What's the subject? You decide. Susan, the results of the latest physical. Say again. Result, results of the latest physical. And someone else, uh, what is the tone of the conversation? I think the doctor is being positive. The patient shows concern. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Hannah, it looks like the doctor is a woman. Would you like to be the doctor just so we can stay true to form here? Absolutely. No, I'm happy to do okay. that. Okay. Let's jump into this. All right. Okay. It's good because I can be my normal negative self. Naj, thank you for coming in. Uh, I do need to talk to you about these uh, test results. So um, if you'd just like to take a seat, we can get started. Sure. How did I do, Doc? Well, um, Naj, I'm, I just want to ask, are you doing okay today? Like, um, your day is not too busy. You're quite calm at the moment. Are, are you saying I got problems that I need to deal with? No, no, no. Uh, just that sometimes the results come through with um, just with an unusual aspect to them. So just, just making sure that you're having a good day. What do you mean by unusual? Unusual. Um, it's not. It's not necessarily that there's anything wrong, Naj. It's just that we don't often see. We don't often see so much verbal ability in in the results from our male patients. I'm not following, Doc. Can you can you tell me more? It's almost as if these this this the results have come through from a female patient. There's lots of language, there's lots of 
um, emotion in here. And I know you, Naj. We've, I've been your doctor for a while. So I, I just have, I want to be positive, but I have a little concern. I know my pronouns, Doc. Um, that's great, Naj. Um, how are you feeling? Well, I was feeling a lot better before I came in here to get the results of this physical. Okay, okay. Um, but I do want to assure you, Naj, that everything's in order. We can just file these and make sure that they're, they're available. But look, um, there's no need to be concerned. All righty. So how did we do, folks? What are you seeing in that one? Throw it into the into the chat box or come on screen, share with us. Alina, did you have anything to add there to observe? Um, it feels like the doctor is very concerned and would like to talk to the patient more about his condition, but it seems like the patient is impatient. <laughs> he just wants to jump in straight like, oh, what's wrong? What do you mean by what's unusual? What is it? So we can see on one side, the patient is just like, okay, no, 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 don't tell me anything else. I just want to know what's wrong. Let's dip it in the butt. But the doctor is more concerning and wanted to share more, but he's not interested in that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alina. Anything else? Def Judith is saying there was a disconnect for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. The woman is wanting to converse more. The man is just wanting his result. And those, did you notice those trigger words in there about there's no need to be concerned and, and the brain, the patient's brain goes to, what are you talking about concerned? Even when we're trying to speak, sometimes the words that we use can be trigger words. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that one or we'll move on? We've got another one or two here. Let's, let's jump into the next one. I think it's the boss employee relationship. Okay. Cool. Um, so what, uh, what is the situation here that you want us to address between boss and employee. You don't have to go by the picture. What is the boss or the employee talking about for this scenario? Throw it up there. Employees' performance isn't quite good enough. Okay. Employees' performance is not good enough. And what is the tone that we should take for this? Annoyance? Annoyance. Okay. Uh, Hannah, what do you think? Do you which would you rather be? I'm totally. I was. I was the the um, power type personality in the last one, leading the conversation. You go ahead okay. and lead this conversation. I'll be the employee. Okay. Hannah, you got a minute? Um, I've. Um, well, I'm just. A, yeah, sure, no problem. I can. I can be with you. Is there something? Do I need to be concerned? Yeah. See this memo I've got here? What do you call this? Uh, that was the memo that you asked me to write to the China division. Yeah. And what did you give me instead? Um, I, well, is it not what you wanted? Look, we're trying to tell them that they need to cut their costs by 30%, be way more efficient, and up their production by 25%. I don't see any of those figures in this document. Well, it, it's in the, if you just read a bit further, Naj, it's on page three. It's not actually figures. It's in paragraph 29. 
And it just sort of says, look, could you just improve a little bit? We're not quite meeting our targets. The day that we open up an artist's colony, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, that's a day that I'll use a memo like this. For now, we need to be telling these people over there what they need to be doing better. But I, I felt that I felt that it would be a bit harsh to, to go straight in and do that. I, I felt that it would be better. I, I just felt that I was I was doing my best. Is it well, not? well, you're you're doing about as well as those guys in the China division are doing. Well, I'm sorry, I'm trying my best. I, what could I do differently? Put on your big boy pants and write a real memo. That's what you could do. <laughs> well. Done. What were you seeing there, folks? What were you seeing from a brain wiring communications perspective? Bosses in control demanding pressure. Yeah. How much communication, how many words that employee had to use? <laughs> mm. Definitely not on the same page. Uh, and also how personal the um, employee felt like it, it was a very it felt like a personal attack whereas the boss just probably wanted to get the numbers up yeah was it unreasonable for the boss to ask for the improvement with poor performance was that an unreasonable request it wasn't an unreasonable request, but it was, there was a dis again a miscommunication. Yeah, between yeah. the two. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Let's jump on to the third and final one. Okay, so this is the coach and the client. Yeah. So what is the topic that the coach and the client are discussing? Throw it out there, folks. What's the topic that we're going to be discussing? It can be brave. Oh, work-life balance. Yep. Let's go with that one, Judith. Loving that. And what is the tone of the conversation? The client really wants to reach B. They want to get to from A to B. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hannah, who are you going to be? You choose, Dal. Uh, how about if you're the coach? Perfect. Okay. So, Nash, great that we have our time together today. If I could just invite you to take a moment and settle your mind and let go of everything today. And when you're ready, let me know when you're ready, what it is you'd like to talk about. Okay. So been having some difficulties. I have a car. I like to drive, I'm at home and it's an amazing car and I really love this car, um, but I can't seem to take it to work. Hmm. Interesting, tell me more. Well, I get dressed for the office, I, put on my suit, have my briefcase, get the car keys, walk outside the house and just stand in the driveway and admire the car. And I just can't drive it from my home to my office. And I end up calling a taxi every day. 
Okay, interesting. Tell me, tell me what makes not being able to drive the car important to you? Well, taxis cost a lot of money. And that's the reason I bought the car in the first place. So I'd be able to get to the office. And it is a really nice car. Yeah. Okay. Naj, what barriers are there for you around the car? Well, for one thing, I can't, I think I have the wrong set of keys, not really opening the door. Okay. And I'm not really sure what to do now. Do you not have your keys on a hook, Nash? Are you not organized to get those sorted and put them away every night so you know where they are? No, I just kind of stuff them in the table, uh, in the bowl on the table in the hallway. You know, Nash, I honestly think you need to be a little bit more organized here. What, what could you do to be more organized? Well, I guess uh, I could either bring the bowl outside and try all the keys to see which ones fit the door of the car. Or you could just put the keys to the car on the hook every day by the door before you leave. Well, How would that sound... work? I, I, I guess that would work. Okay, good. I'm so glad that I've been able to help, Naj. Thank you so much. I really enjoy our conversations. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. What was going on there, folks? Pop it into the chat box or sing it out. Was there any, any obvious indicators of brain wiring in that one? Nash, I mean, what, what's, what were you what's next funny, to Nash? What's, what, what's funny about this is that that is actually how I roll. I, I can't tell you the number of times when I was living in the States that I would run outside, like have to make a train at a certain time, drive to the station and I have my wife's car keys instead of mine because I didn't look, I didn't think. And it was my spare set of car keys for her car. Hers, of course, because she's German, she hangs everything on pegs, actually, not not hooks. But for me, it was like, I literally have a bowl. And it, it happened three, four times in the space of a couple of months to a point where she made a little set of pegs underneath for me. Yeah. Totally see it. Totally see it. The brain wiring in that one, if you notice the um, part of the coach, obviously it wasn't meant to be a CMA coach, definitely a non-CMA coach. Um, being a solutionist, being a bridger, being a solutionist, using that left brain to solve the client's problems without actually allowing the client to explore that for themselves and, and not connecting at all with what the client was saying from an emotional perspective. Yeah. All right. All righty. So let's have a look at some of the science behind this because new technologies um, researchers can actually catch and compare brains in the very act of cognition, feeling and remembering. Who, who would have thought? Scientists can study which part of the brain is being used in different tasks and they have seen differences in the male female brain. When men and women were asked to make their mind blank, which my husband does a lot, uh, the part of the brain that became active in men is the temporal limbic system that controls unsubtle expressions of emotion, for example, like aggression. In a woman's brain, the active part of the brain in the subject studies is in the more evolved posterior cingulate gyrus. Uh, so men, are men prone more to aggression? Um, often with traffic violence, it does tend to involve men more than women. 
Could that be that men drive more? Possibly not. You probably likely to do with, with brain function, but I think a lot of arguments do happen with men and women in cars where, um, yeah, the directions are not quite working when a female is, is potentially driving. All righty. So um, the left brain, right brain, there is there are very real differences. This is our, one of our slides here. It has long been recognized that women tend to have better language skills while men have better math and spatial skills in general. But Jan, I'm loving that you pointed out that you, you personally are able to see that ability of those weren't planted in straight lines. And, you know, who, who actually did that? How did that happen? It's not a given that it's one or the other. The left brain generally controls um, left brain controls language where men and women were doing simple language tests in a study. The language area, which is behind the left eyebrow in both sexes, uh, were being used. But in the women, the area behind the right eyebrow was also used. And the right is the seat of the emotion. I don't know whether you can do this, but I can raise both eyebrows independently. So one goes up. I'll show you. Left brain, right brain. So don't know. The right is the seat of emotion, and it can mean that women use language. They can integrate both feelings, which is right brain, and reason, which is left brain. And it does seem to be a case in a lot of studies. A woman's conversation generally is more complete or replete with details, feelings, and expression, whilst, while men's words are more monosyllabic, grunts, and that they are more rational facts. So... I can vouch for this. I have had two husbands. I'm only having two. Uh, but yeah, I'm learning to accommodate the, the male brain in language. Um, men and women were given pictures of happy and sad faces. Both identified the happy faces easily. But the sad faces both scored roughly the same in identifying the faces on men. But in women, 90% of women and only 70% of men were able to identify a sad expression of a female in the picture. According to research, some research, women's brains didn't have to work as hard um, to excel at judging emotions. Now, for example, many women complain that their husbands don't even realize that they are upset about something. Maybe they should tell their husband instead of expecting him to read facial expressions. Um, yeah, when looking at sad pictures, the same area of the brain is used in men and women. But in women, the active area was eight times as big as the men. So apparently size does matter. Uh, the intensity may explain why women are more affected, more sensitive and more likely to suffer from depression. Uh, it's actually my wedding anniversary today. It is my wedding anniversary. And um, this whole thing about reading facial expressions and um, yeah, uh, not necessarily being able to um, to read the, the interaction between men and female in my marriage with my husband can be challenging at times. All righty, the corpus callosum, the link between the left brain and the right brain is 23 bigger in women than men. There are physiological differences between male and female brains. They're not just anecdotal. This may explain why, why women's language ability survives better after a left brain stroke, perhaps, perhaps because they can tap the language ability of their right brain. Women generally have better language skills because the emotional right brain enriches the left brain vocabulary and there is integration. Um, I'd also anecdotally argue that um, women can often pay attention in school when men's brains out on the rugby field or the soccer field or wherever it wants to be, as you demonstrated, Naj, with the tulips. Um, it may also, the difference between the corpus callosum size may also explain woman's intuition. Um, these tendencies do not mean that they are exclusive of men and women. There are general tendencies, but since ultimately men and women are unique, individual persons with varied backgrounds and experiences, we may also find that each possesses characteristics which are otherwise more natural or innate of the opposite sex. And we do know that there are the, the mismatch there. For example, uh, my husband uh, obviously enjoys movies. Uh, a lot of, uh, all, lot of, lots of us enjoy movies. I'm the kind of person that will cry at a lassie come home movie. And I'm, I'm in the whole emotional thing. Um, he doesn't get it at all. So we do, we do. We know that this is anecdotally lived experience. We need to be actually aware of it when we are coaching. Of course, Naj and I have exaggerated some of the differences for the demonstration purposes. However, 
Each of us has real lived experience and examples of communication mismatches, both in coaching situations and everyday life that have occurred because of the processing differences in our brains. And this is not just male, female. There are lots of other uh, impactors for brain wiring, cultural impacts, uh, language impacts, etc. But certainly brain wiring is, is one of those. And whilst we may naturally prefer to communicate pe with people and clients that understand us and that are who are on the same page as us as coaches, the opportunity that we have in engaging with clients who are demonstrating an obviously different communication style is to be aware of the differences and to respond objectively accordingly. We serve our clients best by accepting them as they present and adjusting our own thinking and communication style to maximize the interaction in the moment. Um, Albert Einstein, of course, scientist and philosopher Einstein reportedly said that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And it's sort of pivotal for coaching situations and everyday relationships. We need to be aware of our thinking, be aware of brain wiring impactors to be able to be the adult in the room and adjust how we respond to other people. Being aware of how our brains impact communications gives us the opportunity to choose our response, which is a powerful and transformational tool. Chat GTP type platforms, which is where we started right at the top here, lack the emotional intelligence currently that comes from heart to heart, human to human interaction. So thank you. Thank you, Naj, for um, being an improv partner there and doing um, what we did for that. Thank you uh, team and thank you everyone on the call for throwing in ideas and little bits and pieces. Yeah, just interested in your thoughts and feedback around um, this part of today's Zoom call so far before we transition into the next part of the call. Any observations or comments uh, that you've got there? Well, I just want to. Uh, I just want to first thank you, uh, Hannah and Nash, both for sharing with us and for your courage and bravery in doing improv. Because I know from personal experience, it, it's not always easy. So thank you very much. You did a great job. Um, thank you for um, enriching us with not only. Um, scientific information and communication information, which sometimes can be dry. You really infused it with a lot of humor uh, and gave us some real life personal examples. And so I just wanna say thank you because I really appreciated um, all of that. And you know, just the differences between men and women's communication and even just, um, I really liked what Naz you said earlier about our role as coaches to really pull back the onion and find the person underneath. That was pretty cool. So um, I just want to say thanks, but, and then we'll see, open it up to anybody else who has any other thoughts, anybody else from the cohort or anyone here. Be good to have that round table as well, if we can, yeah. Yeah, any other sharings? I would love to hear from some of uh, our cohort members. Alina, Ryan, any thoughts? Anything you want to share that you picked up from today or? I think it's mostly very interesting, although it's something that we are all familiar with, but now to put it in scientific terms and to see how Hannah and Arch role play, it's, it's very clear to us that we are really wired differently. And in fact, it's not just male or female specifically, because sometimes there are females who are actually more of the male, have more of the male uh, character traits. And, and you'll see that um, they often take up specific roles in a company which usually the men take so that's very interesting as well because you realize that upbringing plays a huge part because this lady she might have four other brothers living with her 
So she's brought up in a way whereby she has more of the male character traits. But all in all, it's very interesting. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you, Natch and Hannah. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. It's, um, again, we were amplifying and exaggerating, but in that last scenario as well with um, the coach and client, the, although the coach was female, took a very dominant uh, driven role, uh, solutionist, not a, not a transformational coach at all, but very left brain driven to a client that was less uh, left brain, uh, more right brain in that situation. So good to be able to see the differences, eh? Thank you, Alina. I loved, um, you used an Einstein quote around that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we use to create them. One of the things I found interesting just in the, um, you know, the physiological, you, there's the the quotes of the discovery of different size of things in male and, and female brains. But one of the things about Einstein's brain was that actually the overall brain size was not a large brain, wow. but the connector between the left and the right was extremely strong. Wow, thanks for sharing. Yeah, it, that's possibly the, a key takeout, right? That we, to develop that link between, I don't know how we do it physiologically, but if we're intentional about using both sides of our brain, we will be better communicators. We will have greater intuition. We will be able to read people and situations in a more um, holistic way. And not to fall, not be tempted to fall into a stereotype, whether it's a um, gender specific stereotype or a role specific stereotype either. Mm. Thank you, Jan. Awesome. Hi, I just want to share some thoughts. I really enjoyed the um, uh, presentation and it's very uh, lively, especially in the morning. Um, I was, you know, very intrigued, like uh, by the earlier part of the presentation about uh, we do have our own uh, personal uh, algorithm, you know, that affects the way we think and all that, right? So then, in a way, I do get a sense that you know it might be like past experiences, um, things, you know, that really affect the left and and, and right brain in in thinking. Right, like the example that you gave about the um, you were acting up about the flowers, you know how how appreciating the flowers, and and it's like um it, it almost feels like a a person can have a different mindset if, if a person is not uh healthy if I could use the word healthy right in the in the mindset, and it will be taking that oh you know, the response is taking, you know, just being judgmental and all that. So it's just very interesting how we have our own um, personal algorithm in thinking and, and understanding the neuroscience behind it and how we can, you know, put everything together. And that's, that's very uh, interesting. Yeah, thank you for adding that in. That's totally on point. Thank you, Jan. I thought I saw another hand earlier. Was that Azade? Yeah, I really love this point that um, just came up in the discussion right now about um, the different, uh, you know, inclinations that we may have in our, regardless, female or male, of the tendency of light, right brain or left brain, and how coaching through. Um, the observations or the mirroring that the coach makes brings an objectivity to the client to be able to see and to think uh, from a broader perspective and an expanded perspective. And what's really exciting is um, how there is the potential to expand the capacity that Jan is talking about, that part that we can actually train ourselves to expand that. So I think that's really exciting to see. And, and it really brings for me the curiosity, you know, um, how people engage so that they are actually activating both sides or, you know, it's like training the, the muscles, right? Like we do in gym. And I think that um, this is one powerful um, takeaway. 
Um, thank you, Nash and Hannah, for you know over amplifying and really acting out what we can all relate to, whether in a personal context or a professional context. We can really see that, and um, I really, uh, I really appreciate how you have now brought this lens um, and how we can see how coaching can be supportive for us um, in, in bringing, in strengthening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Azadeh. You know, the, the data that is in here about the limbic system and the corpus casolum, uh, corpus casolum and all of that, um, it really puts a new um, scientific lens over for example, the saying having an open mind, or if we think somebody has an open mind or a closed mind, you know, there is always the potential to open the mind further. And of course, with CMA coaching as well, the transformative coaching, that's crucial in terms of a, co a client coach conversation, but in life generally to in encourage those around us, children and so on, to have that open mind to, to be that bridge between the left and the right, right brain. Mm. Thank you. And Ryan, I think you had uh, an example that you had shared with us previously. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share that. I think it had something to do with the, I don't, I don't remember, I think it was the army or something. Yeah. Um, so uh, a bit of context, I'm a member of the New Zealand Defence Force and was fortunate enough to be a part of a course or a training for um, a similar sort of topic around how the, the wiring of the man and the woman's brain can vary our solutions or how we tackle um, problems. And a really good example that was presented during this course was during a humanitarian disaster, which is it's a horrible event to happen, but unfortunately they do happen and they're increasing in um, the frequency. And the example was when an event happens and the power and the water system is um, damaged, the military or civil um, services will go in and set up toilets, food, and different services. And how a male may look at the solution and go, we need toilets and put portacoms and we need showers and put a tent there. But what they don't remember, well, what they don't consider is the lighting the the walkways of how to get there the shielding or what you'd say like a screen because women normally will take their child with them and so what you'd find is that during some humanitarian um, disaster events is that people would provide showers and portacoms but because the males thought about it and like we just they'll just put the solution there and, and walk away, they forget that the, the soft approach, which would be that a woman needs a place to either put the child or to go through and feel shelter, or feel um, safe and secure, which would be the lighting. Um, but then on a, a lighter note, another one I had coaching a friend is that a friend of mine, he's an engineer and he describes himself as his emotional band is very small. Uh, and he doesn't ex experience the highs and lows like some people do. And his wife, um, she's the opposite. And so when she asks him for advice, he gives it in the way that you'd expect an engineer to do, which is facts and figures, ones and zeros. And she just wants that emotional, someone to validate that emotional roller coaster. Um, so as you can imagine, it creates for some interesting. Uh, listening when I'm in the room as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that example. <laughs> wow. But what a great example on a much larger scale, right? Because we were we've been talking really about the um much more almost like uh, individual communication between two people. So I um, I appreciate that example on a much larger scale of when we're not really taking into consideration some of these differences look what the snowballing can be so thank you very much for that any other thoughts takeaways
Anyone else? Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, yeah, um, I've been attending uh, several uh, sessions during this coaching week, and um, and 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 just uh, last night, I uh, I've been observing about privilege, and then uh, I I have. I just noticed something connecting here, like um, in the uh, no yesterday afternoon actually, and the privilege uh, gave us kind of like a view of how we are in the um, in the um, understanding of the difference between the two in the conversation, and then now this um, context regarding to the white brain difference between men and women. Uh, give me another uh, thinking or understanding about how different we are. And then from that lens, we, we, we understand more about how the other person think and feel and, and have kind of like connection with the context because we are different, right? So women tends to be more feeling and, and details and the other one is obviously different. And then in some context or some conversation, that may bring to misunderstanding. And if we step back a little bit and observe that kind of like um, in a bigger view, and then we, we have kind of like empathy or a little bit on understanding how the other one understand it and ask for more to understand or at least share how we think, how we feel. And then that will bring the conversation or, or anything to an alignment or in the same page of, okay, how we are different and how we bridge the gap of the difference. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing this topic to this um, fruitful learning week. Thank you. Good, very, some really great points. So we thank you very much. Hannah, You have your hand raised. You have more to say, Mayor to share? Yes, I have. Thank you for that. Um, honestly, it's interesting as a coach, what you've just made me think about there in commenting, Cho, was um, if I have a client, a, a coaching client that is very um, verbal and, and descriptive in their language, you know, the ability for use of metaphors, for example, could be very timely and very useful for that for that client and for the coach. So being able to read and um, read, hear and read a client visually and pick up on the language that they're using, not only for loss gain game frame, but also for their predominant thinking style, for example, as a coach is obviously going to be very useful to um, to be able to keep be very present in the moment and to serve the client very well. So thank you for the comments. I appreciate that. Um, just quickly, one thing from having worked in, in Europe and across Asia and different places, I noticed, uh, I've noticed that the way that you address people depends so much on language and culture. And I, I mean, I always make mistakes, but the way that you're so direct in Germany, because people are so direct with you, they don't ask questions just to be pleasant. When they ask you how you, when you ask them how they are, they give you a whole discourse on their ingrown toenail and, you know, all this other nonsense. But, um, you know, in China, when you ask somebody, how are you? It's very, you get the answer back. Good. You know, just kind of vague. And, and there's, there's a lot of like surface level communication that you need to get through before you can really, someone really trusts you. And, and, and I, anyway, so I, I think it's not just um, what brain part of the brain you use uh, it also has a lot to do with where you come from, what language you speak, what the cultural norms are. You know, I, I was re re relying heavily on my U.S. upbringing when I, you know, you saw the slides of um, Edward Bernays and David Ogilvie. I'm sure there are other influences in other parts of the world as well. Thank you. Good point. Good point. Thank you very much for that. And just to in case somebody hasn't checked the chat box, Ben was kind enough to put a few downloads there for us. So thank you very much, Ben, for that. Um, at this time, I think I'm going to ask Jan to do a wrap up for us. If you'll kind of 
kind of recap everything for us, Jan, we would really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I think somewhat of a challenge to um, talk to all of the great discussion points that have been raised. But first of all, just acknowledging everybody that has contributed and thank you very much to um, Wendy, yourself and, and Naj and Hannah for the great input and, and also Maribel for all the work that went on behind the scenes to um, put this together. But um, I guess really the, the takeouts for me, the, the differing points of view that have been expressed really reinforce the topic um, because, you know, we've had so much uh, discussion around the, this research that has found differences between men and women and the, the use of the brain um, when processing information. And, and we talked to or we heard from Hannah around the, the left brain dominance, if you like, or predominance for males, responsible for that logic and analysis. And then in contrast, that women use both sides, allowing for a more integrated and holistic approach to problem solving. And this is so impactful on our coaching. Um, so I think the point has been made um, by a few speakers of that as coaches, we need to be flexible in our approach so that we can work and accommodate with the different thinking styles of our clients. So, you know, the variations in thinking styles are influenced by a complex interplay of things, whether it's the biological, whether it's the psychosocial, whether it's the social, socio-cultural or environmental factors. It's not a given. And I think as Naj, you talked to, it's about the rituals and the traditions and experiences that people have had um, that also brings them together uh, to be able to be who they are. And, you know, as coaches, that's really important that we can address that. And I think that analogy of the peeling the onion to under, uncover the person underneath was a really key point. And, and I think for me that one of the key things that comes through is that actually the core skill that we as coaches must use is our effective questioning because that's what's going to uncover and unpeel the onion to discover what it is that is on the mind of this um, person or client that we're coaching and and how we can best um, pull, pull their learning through with them. So it's a really important implication for coaching and, and having an awareness of the differences, the neurodiversity of, of everyone but the differences may enhance our coaching perspectives and our processes and help better understand different clients' communication styles, their needs, their thinking processes, and that in turn leading us to be able to coach them more effectively and have better outcomes. So being mindful of all these differences, um, coaches can create a more inclusive coaching environment that can accommodate those diverse needs of, of our clients. So the brain wiring awareness can enhance that ICF, um, credentialing markers, the cultivating trust and safety, the maintaining presence, and the listening actively to our clients. So we hope we've raised the bar and your thinking, um, your awareness on brain wiring. And again, just thank you to all the participants and all the input and examples have enriched the process. Um, there are uh, lots of live coaching demonstrations in CMA because we believe and we know all that every person, whether it's a faculty member or um, every student in the cohorts, it's always a learning path. So there's, there's lots there. And I would just share from my perspective, joining the group internationally to learn together, so many different styles and viewpoints. And, and for me, a big learning is the slow down to speed up. Um, the listening and learning as a coach with coaches has been a very enriching experience um, and the benefits of curiosity and questioning. Um, so I think I've also got, and I'm sure, not sure Maribel if I'm throwing to you, but I've got an announcement around the next cohort. Um, so that the next cohort begins on May the 15th at 8 p.m. New York time, 8 a.m. Singapore and 12 noon in New Zealand. So at this point, it's um, I'm going to throw back to Mary Bell, but just wanting to put together the huge learning opportunities of sharing experiences. And thank you for the science and the research that gives us a greater awareness and a place to start. But it really does come down to us as individuals, coaching individuals where they are. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Jan. Well, I, I'd like to say that, uh, my goodness, uh, 
cohort 374 is a, is a powerhouse. <laughs> and kudos to everyone. Naj, Wendy, Hannah, Jan, uh, Alina, uh, Ryan, who else? Uh, uh, and Zoe. Yeah, right. And I'd like to invite also uh, my co uh, faculty members who are here to say their last words uh, as well as I thank all of them because my heart is full. My heart is just full. Ben, thank you so much for this opportunity. And Ben, thank you so much for all the gifts that you've been dropping in the chat box. There's so rich materials, you know. My goodness, that's uh, it, it's so costly and everything's right there. <laughs> and he's still trying to find one for us. <laughs> Okay, so how about my co, uh, okay, my co-faculty members, Ning, Azade, yeah, and uh, would you like to say something, please? Yeah, um, thank you, Marina, and yeah, I, I really appreciate how um, this cohort is sent. Well, I wouldn't say this is the closing for this cohort because we have the graduation, yeah, I mean, in another two weeks, but, but, yeah, it showed the power. And I just want to echo what Yana Chow just mentioned here that empathy is um, kind of, I mean, empathy really build this connection between male and females and cohorts, you know, where bring all of, I mean, all of us from many parts of the world together here. And yeah, at least we have some common things here that we understand that people are different, but those different really unite us to be one. Yeah, thank you. Over to you, Asade. I think I can just echo what you said. And this this um, cohort has been so inspiring, the way that you support one another, the way you uh, learn together, the way you um interact with one another it's just so inspiring it makes you think that actually differences are good because that's how they bring people together and um yeah it's been so refreshing i i i love the energy and the um you know um broad sense of um with which you're looking at coaching and you're also taking us a little bit into this broader sense of um, integrating the neuroscience um, into the, the science of what we're learning today. But mostly what I'm taking away is you guys' um, spirit together. This, um, for me, rather than seeing what well, my takeaway is that despite the difference between male and female, I think that there is so much that brings us together that Hannah and Naj presented today. And um, it brings humor as well. The differences yeah. are good. <laughs> today, when I listen to my husband with his German logical brain, I will be like, oh, okay. <laughs> Don't ask him about the toenail. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Azadeh. I forgot that Eva is also here. Uh, she's one also of our training directors and faculty members from Africa. Eva, are you there? Would you like to say some, a few words? Hi. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I can't turn on the, I the video that, that right now. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I didn't catch the beginning, but so far, um, I really appreciated um, the, the the awareness that I've gotten from the little that I've uh, picked up, and um, it's quite informative. I have more questions than anything, <laughs> and more on uh, research on what the research has. So um, I appreciate all, especially the books. I don't know when I'll get to read them, but uh, I appreciate the books that. Uh, ben is giving because that's more information that will help us be more aware. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for this. <laughs> okay, thank you for being here. We really appreciate your presence. And uh, Ben, would we be able to hear a few words from you, even if you don't show your face? I know it's so early. <laughs> Uh, 
so Ben, will you be able to say something to the to us? He, he no, says he's coughing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, right. He's sick. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. So yeah, thank you very much to everyone. And uh, we really appreciate uh, what you've done. Uh, yeah, how, I want to reserve it for today. Oh, yeah, he has a live uh, coaching demonstration today. So everyone's invited to the live coaching demonstration. So we better make sure we're present for Ben to support him as well. <laughs> okay. So yeah, if there's uh, nothing else, is there anything else that uh, some maybe child? Oh, a child is also here. She's also a faculty member. I'm so sorry, I missed out on you. Would you like to say something? Well, it's okay, Maribel. I I really appreciate this topic um, during this coaching week because it's kind of like for me, it's kind of a dot to link all the other topics together like uh, to remind us as a human being uh, to understand about who we are, uh, what we have, and to appreciate the other person that we are interacting with. And then from that point, we bring the empathy. And then with the coaching um, method we have in the ACC framework, we can support the other one to uncover the potential they have and move forward with the goal they have. So I think this part is one of the dots that we have to create the whole change. Yeah, I really thank you for bringing this topic during this week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chao Yu. Thank you very much for being here and for everyone who has come. I know that uh, Judy and Hannah has all attended almost every almost every webinar. So we really appreciate you. They're coming also from uh, North America. They're from uh, J uh, Jamaica, oh, no, Trinidad and Tobago. All right, so we just want to continue to encourage everyone to uh, live on in, uh, in this community that we have in CMA. As you have witnessed, learning is such a rich, it's a rich environment for learning that we have here in CMA. And I think this is uh, an added value that we uh, we need to appreciate. It's something that we don't pick up from any other institution because it's uh, it's just there. It's always available for us. And uh, as everyone has said, the interaction at the international flavor that we have is so enriching as well. So with that, I'd like to continue to invite everyone to uh, move up, keep moving. If you're in the core level, move up to the advanced level. If you're in the advanced level, move up to the MCC level. Keep moving, keep learning, and let's all become uh, great coaches. Okay, so with that, I'd like to say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> so Wendy, we don't have any music anymore. To get <laughs> Thank you so Bye, much. Everyone. Goodbye, everyone. No, you, you want me to put more music on, don't you, Maribel? <laughs> As a day, always wants my music. <laughs> but Ben keeps giving us. My gosh, we need to thank Ben. Ben, that's a lot. Thank you so wow, much. Wow, Ben, we thank you. That. Yeah, he's he sent another one now. Yeah, okay, I so hope I need more time. Others, yeah, go ahead. To be able to read all this. Uh-huh. I think.